All right. Well, hello, everyone. Now, welcome to the program. As always, I am absolutely thrilled that you are here. If you've never checked us out before, we are primarily an interview and a commentary podcast. A little of both today. It's an interview, but we're also going to be talking about some current events. On the line with me is Lori Spencer. Lori, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Wonderful to finally meet you. I'm a fan. Thanks for having me on. Likewise, you are the uh, consummate uh, professional, uh, you know, just love your work. Thank you. So it's great to have you here. Let me tell, tell the audience just a little bit about you. Radio personality and a journalist, Lori Spencer, is the American correspondent for Maverick News and the co-host of the Strange Bedfellows podcast. Lori is a veteran reporter and anchor with more than 35 years of experience in print and broadcast news. Her work has appeared in numerous daily and weekly newspapers, magazines, online news portals, you name it. Lori is also a JFK historian who has devoted decades to the study of John F. Kennedy's presidency and is currently a volunteer on the 2024 presidential campaign of Robert F. Kennedy Jr., which is actually Bobby Kennedy's son, if you didn't know that. Lori produces the Kennedy Americans podcast and hosts regular Twitter spaces, X spaces now. And uh, we'll briefly describe those if you don't know what they are. Um, but you have quite the, the background um, in news and broadcasting. What about you? Like, where are you from? Just a, what are some personal tidbits? Where are you from originally? I was born and raised in Oklahoma. And then I lived in Austin, Texas for 25 years. And now I'm back in Oklahoma again and much happier here, actually. <laughs> it's affordable, mm. nice people. Okay. I love the heartland, and it's great to be back home. Awesome. That is fantastic. Let me um, set the kind of a, a, a stage here for what I feel this discussion is going to be all about, because... I'm I'm of I'm not 21 years old anymore, and I remember being around when uh, Reagan and Tip O'Neill were having their differences. I remember to that an extent, too. <laughs> Clinton and uh, uh, um, Newt Gingrich, all those people. And what was different about that time is, yes, everybody argued there was a lot of bad things going on. There was a lot of dirtiness in politics, just like there is now. But everybody agreed the sky is up there, and if you drop something, it falls. It doesn't go up. And uh, now there is an alternate reality that everybody seems to be in. It's it's to the point now where people are not only entitled to their own opinion, but they're entitled to their own facts. And I would go beyond that. They're entitled to their own universe uh, where space and time exist differently for them. Yeah, it's like everyone's entitled to their own reality. I've never seen anything uh, like it. and it used to be just the fringes, but that's not the case anymore. Right. Um, and even, even what you might call the fringes still take up an enormous part of the electorate. So my question to you is, you've been, you've been watching politics and all these other things for years. If you're a, a straight shooting politician, so to speak, and, and you want to get a, a good grassroots campaign going by telling the truth and being honest, can you win? in that environment without catering to that craziness to some degree? Hmm. You know, I ask myself that question all the time, working uh, as a volunteer with uh, Robert Kennedy, Um, Mm -hmm. because that's, you know, he says that his campaign is a radical experiment in truth telling. And it's sad in a way that telling the truth is now radical, (laughs) but that's where we are in American politics and media Um, You probably notice that some of the most popular podcasts that have the largest audience are the ones that cater to some really wild out there stuff, you know, and that's what brings the audience. Um, When you're just doing straight journalism, the way that I was trained, the way that you were trained, probably uh, we were trained back in the day to do objective journalism to not Mm -hmm. you know put our opinion in there the best editor i ever had always told me nobody cares about your opinion you're the journalist you're just supposed to tell us what happened journalists have one job and that's to tell you what happened today as best we can ascertain 
Um, sure. And sometimes that evolves as a story evolves and we learn more details. And if we're wrong, we're supposed to issue a correction and say, sorry, we got that wrong. Uh, to me, that's responsible journalism, ethical journalism. But that's not what's popular right now. That's It doesn't seem to be what the masses want. And I think the same yep. is true in politics. You know, we've had the rise of Donald Trump and, you know, as much as he likes to cry about fake news and he's right, there is a lot of fake news. He's also responsible for generating a lot of fake news himself. Um, Joe Biden sat there and, you know, gaslit the American public for an hour last night at the State of the Union address. And yeah. just about everything that came out of his mouth wasn't true. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Kennedy's to me, a breath of fresh air because he is just telling yeah. it like it is. Well, I hope enough people can gravitate to that because I think the American public, I put a lot of the blame uh, on the American public because they, they don't want to hear things that fundamentally go against what their idea of here again of their own personal universe should be. Right. So, and those people vote and those people vote and, and I'll take it a step further. You know, we hear a lot about uh, conspiracy theories regarding the government. I think what's happening in, to a lot of degree is the founding fathers had some things in place. OK, they had some things in place. We're not an absolute democracy because the line between democracy and mob rule is razor thin. So we have a constitution. We have some other things. And that, a lot of people don't understand. That's why um, the uh, Electoral College and all these other things exist, because they knew the wisdom of the public couldn't always be trusted. And here's what I mean by that. If you had put up civil rights or human rights or any of those things up to a vote any time in the recent past or even today throughout the world and in different parts of the United States, I'm sure the result would not be what you want. <laughs> OK, so true. So there have to be some. So there have to be some things that are non-negotiable. So we're to the point now where those safety valves are starting to drip. The, 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 you know, the safety valves are holding everything they can in, in, in our democratized government. But I, I think the wisdom of the American public is starting to flounder. And I, and I say that getting back to what I said here earlier, I, I hope that we can write that ship because there's just too many people living in false realities and they want to be fed a fairy tale. And that makes it very difficult for any politician. Do you have more hope than I do? <laughs> well, you know, Billy, I'm the eternal optimist. Okay. Always have been. Even in these dark times, um, that's why I do Maverick News. That's why I do Strange Bedfellows. I think that even though the audience is smaller than we might like it to be, I still think that there are people out there who aren't crazy and who still appreciate good, solid, objective reporting, good journalism. Mm -hmm. um, I wish that the audience was bigger. <laughs> I, I wish that more people desired that. Um, but we refuse yeah. to feed people's fantasies on Maverick News. And in that sense, I'm completely mm -hmm. aligned ideolog ideologically uh, with Robert Kennedy. Um, and that's why, of course, I've, I've wanted him to run for president for 20 years. I don't know if you know that mm -hmm. story, but I was pestering him uh, back in 2007 to run for president as part of a draft Kennedy campaign. Um, but the okay. time is right. The time is now. And I feel like oh. America is on a, a perilous path um, if we don't right this ship and quickly. I'm yeah. afraid we're going to sink. I would agree it's the right time. Circumstances are such with uh, both of the candidates right now. And here again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak to the audience being objective, very both unpopular. OK, and we've had uh, elections now based on what I would call the anti vote. That's essentially what elected Biden uh, was the anti Trump vote. And to a large degree, Trump got elected in 2016 on the anti Hillary vote. Uh, we've had very few uh, what I would call candidates that people voted for during my lifetime. Now, Reagan would be one. Clinton would be one. Obama would be one in 2008. Those were people that inspired a vote. But for the most part, 
to one degree or another, all the other elections have been anti-votes. So I, 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 I hope that being that the two major party candidates are, are them in and of them by themselves, anti-votes, uh, they're both the oldest and I, and I, and I don't want to sound ageist here. Um, I have nothing against, uh, any, per, uh, capable person, but you're not being objective here again. If you don't realize that, uh, Biden is in steep decline, Trump is not the same person he was in 2016. Now I think he's still capable, but he's not the same person he was. So, uh, both of them are the oldest candidates ever and the records they have broken in terms of being the oldest candidates ever. <laughs> Are records they have set originally. <laughs> so um, I, I think that the time is right. I think uh, a third party candidate in a third choice anyway is something that's very attractive. So you might be in the middle of, of the perfect set of circumstances right now. Is that how you feel? Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah. the, the polls reflect that. Um, yeah. Even before Bobby Kennedy got in the race. I remember last year we were reporting on this growing trend of independence and that they were mm -hmm. quickly becoming the largest uh, registered block of voters. Almost 60 percent said that they wanted another choice besides Biden or Trump. And they were just waiting for a good choice. You know, usually yeah. third party candidates, independent candidates are often fringy. Um, and mm -hmm. don't really appeal to enough mainstream voters uh, to right. want to cast their vote for them. But Kennedy entered the race and he just starts talking good common sense, solid policy, sane policy and policy that mm -hmm. isn't necessarily left or right. It's it appeals yes. to both. I like that. Yeah, there's a lot that we can agree on. And that's kind of the whole point of the show that I do, Strange Bedfellows, is I bring in people who might be uh, political or ideological opposites, and we sit down and we have a real conversation, not a debate, not an argument, where we find some points of agreement. And I mm -hmm. think that's how we heal the divide. And that's, of course, the campaign's slogan for Kennedy is yes. heal the divide. And I don't know if you saw his uh, State of the Union Last night, you know, Kennedy did sort of a yeah, alternative yeah, State it. of the Union. It was really, really good. Um, and that was his message, too, was he believes and I believe that Americans are tired of the division. We're tired of being pitted against one another by the Republicans and the Democrats and that we're looking yep. for common ground. And it's the only way that we can heal this country. Okay. I, I hope this is something that can move forward. If you would have asked me six months ago about Trump, I would have said he's going to get the nomination, but there's no way he's going to win the general election. I, I don't mm. believe that's true. Now I believe he could win. I do too. And as much as I hate uh, to say and, that, but I, I, I'm paying attention yeah. to the polls. Obviously my guy's sure. in it to win it. Um, but right now Trump has got a pretty good lead in the polls. Yes. And uh, same about RFK. If he did ask me six months ago, I'd say he's, you know, he's going to make some news, but he's, he's not going to make a dent in it. I don't believe he's a long shot anymore. I believe he has an uphill battle, but I, I don't believe he's a long shot anymore. A lot of what yeah. Kennedy is doing is with the new media, what you might call the new media. Like you and I have been involved in that. And X has gone through what the old Twitter has gone through a transformation. And Kennedy is one of the um, candidates that's utilizing that very heavily. He's very much part of what's going on online. The other two, not so much. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, like, you have the spaces. And for people that, that don't know, uh, X spaces or Twitter spaces are basically audio forums where you have a host like Lori. She can have a co-host if she if so chooses. She can bring up a number of different uh, speakers as guests. And you can have just tons of people in there listening to these things. RFK Jr. did one here about a week or two ago. So this is something that is is that he is utilizing. So we have a new media happening here. Uh, Tucker Carlson, Don Lemon, all these people from legacy media are coming here. Um, is, th is this part of the perfect storm, too? Because he's utilizing, he kind of reminds me of Bill Clinton in 1992, who really catered to the MTV people, and everybody laughed at him, and he ended up winning the election. That's right. And I, I kind of see 
I, I kind of see similarities with what Kennedy is doing online and the other two totally oblivious to, to it. Uh, is that part of, do you believe that is something that is going to surprise a lot of people? That's an excellent observation. And yes, I agree. That is our strategy. Um, you know, Kennedy's mm -hmm. uh, strongest support is with voters under 45. In the young, in the Gen okay. Z and some of the millennials, he's beating Biden and Trump. Um, interestingly enough, the demographic where he's performing not as well, or I guess you could say the worst, is the boomer demographic. Yeah. Because those folks enough. still get their news from traditional media, television, radio, newspapers. And, and perfect example of that. After the State of the Union last night, I turned on ABC News because I wanted to see what they were saying after the State of the Union. And they went to the big board, you know, where they show you the poll mm -hmm. numbers and, and they showed Biden and Trump's favorability, which both of them are terrible on favorability. <laughs> this is an election where the yeah. people really don't like either of the choices that they have to choose from. But Bobby sure. Kennedy in every poll beats both Biden and Trump in terms of favorability. But he wasn't even listed. He wasn't on the board. They didn't even put his name up there. They're mm -hmm. really. And yet they showed Dean Phillips and Marianne Williamson and candidates that are polling at less than 10 percent. Um, so it just doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense because you've got Kennedy polling anywhere from 24 to 34 percent, which I think is remarkable. And they don't even acknowledge him. Mm -hmm. It's like he was the invisible man last night. Yeah. One of the reasons why that might happen is uh, I, Van Jones on CNN made a comment about him this week where he said, you better watch out because he's starting, he's starting to light up. But he did say that a lot of the traditional media and a lot of the people that, that follow the news have kind of, I'm paraphrasing here, put him in, in, in the in the category of, yes, he was very uh, progressive when it comes to the environment and other things, but he's also an anti-vax nut. <laughs> and this is something that, um, you know, here again, just being frank, is something that follows him, rightly or wrongly. Hmm. How do you, when you get addressed that question, um, how do you answer it when, when people say, well, he's, he's one of those anti-vax nut cases? How, how do you answer that? I say that he just wants safe and effective, thoroughly tested vaccines. Um, and, you know, that's one of those things when we get to the debates in September, if Trump and Biden will actually agree to debate Mr. Kennedy, he's going to hit them both hard. Trump on Operation Warp Speed, uh, rushing these vaccines to the public, essentially making the public lab rats testing an unproven brand new product um, that has indeed got some pretty scary side effects for some people. And Joe Biden yeah. for forcing people to take it with the vaccine mandates, not to mention the whole civil rights issue that's tied to the mandates where unvaccinated people were literally excluded from society and from public places. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Kennedy, I think, has a, a very strong, logical argument to make. He's not anti-vaccine. All of his kids are vaccinated. Um, he took his vaccines. He just didn't take the COVID vax. Um, yeah. But he's, I, as far as I know, he's taken all of the others. As long as he's satisfied with the safety profile, then he would take the vaccine. But when it came to COVID, he felt, and I agree, that that vaccine was rushed through the process. Vaccines can take years and years of safety testing, and it just wasn't done. We were in such a hurry to get that vaccine out there, and both Trump and Biden wanted to, for political reasons, take the credit for saving millions of lives with this vaccine. Um, but yeah. it turns out they may not have saved as many lives as they told us they did. Sure. Yeah, that's the difference. Um, what happens a lot of times in today's pol political world is like, for example, when liberals criticize conservatives, and I'm neither, um, about the immigration issue, they never differentiate. They say conservatives are anti-immigration. They, they, they leave the illegal crossings out. Okay. 
And what happens with the vaccines as well, there's different categories of vaccines. And, and this is something that's nuanced. And here again, getting back to the American public, we don't have patience for nuance. But for example, the smallpox vaccine, um, that worked. Uh, they figured out that that worked 200 years ago. and They didn't know why it worked because the microbiology wasn't advanced enough, but they figured out why it worked. And a flu, other things are actually made of the flu virus. Um, and there's a difference there. Now, now, sometimes the flu vaccine is their best guess, but it is still the flu. What happens with these mRNA uh, vaccinations is they are essentially programming your system to attack something that's probably there. And that is where you have a lot of room for problems. Okay, because you essentially have an army in your system looking for some disease to attack. And it better be programmed uh, correctly or it goes in the wrong places. And I think that's something that here again, the the American public just doesn't have the, the, the patience to to wade through that nuance. And now you have people who won't take any vaccines. They, they don't want their kids to have measles vaccines mm. or mumps or anything. And now we have all these outbreaks coming on. And it's because people just don't understand the nuances of, of these different things. So I understand why people get mad when they hear somebody talking against vaccines, because as a whole, they are a good thing. I think mm -hmm. we can all agree on that. I mean, polio and all those things are not problems anymore. Right. But... There's this idea of what you're talking about, where they have become something that is uh, packaged, branded and sent out uh, with sometimes very little accountability. Um, and that's a real problem. I think that's if he can get that message across, I think that might be a good thing. Do you agree with me on that? I sure do. And people forget that okay. the uh, Salk vaccine, the polio vaccine, it went through, I believe, about two and a half years of yeah. clinical trials and tests before it was given to the public. And that was probably the most fast tracked vaccine that we had prior to the COVID vaccine. Um, yeah. And, you know, I agree with you that uh, most vaccines, especially the old fashioned attenuated vaccines um, are safe and effective for most people. Um, of course, as with any drug or any intervention, some people are going to have Oh, adverse sure. reaction it's just not going to be the same every body is different everybody everybody's immune system is different um but that's exactly why i personally chose not to take the covid vaccine and i paid a price i lost a job mm -hmm. because of it um because i wouldn't comply mm -hmm. with the company's vaccine mandate we've all paid a price whether it was social yeah. exclusion oh, yes. or exclusion from a job um, if you chose not to take the vaccine, you were punished. And if you did choose to take the vaccine and you had an adverse reaction, you're also suffering, not just your health, but there's no compensation for you. You literally cannot sue the vaccine manufacturer. That's how it works, unfortunately. And that's yeah. something that Bobby Kennedy also draws attention to because he's a lawyer. He's been litigating for people who've been harmed by whether it was vaccines or environmental injury. He's been doing that for 40 years. And I think he makes a very strong and convincing case that uh, these vaccines for some people did more harm than good. Yeah. yeah and I would strongly suggest uh, if you feel that RFK Jr. is a conspiracy theorist, to look at his book about Fauci. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a well-documented book with references and everything. Uh, and it, when you read through that, to say that this just came out of somebody's imagination is not fair. Now, whether or not you, there's, you know, you want to make an argument against it or, or whatever, that's up to you. But these, it, it's it, it's a pretty scary book. I don't know if you've gone through it or not. Oh, yeah, with a fine-tooth um, comb. Getting... Okay. And by the way, <laughs> um, Dr. Fauci RF has never, yes. ever filed a lawsuit saying that Bobby Kennedy lied or slandered him or, or libeled him in that yeah. book. Everything in the book is footnoted, documented, cross-referenced, and accurate. Yeah. Otherwise, he'd be getting sued, and he hasn't been. Yes. The book's been out for two years now. Yes. 
Interesting read if you want to check that out. Oh, yeah. Interestingly, you had mentioned uh, we're, we're recording this on Friday night, the night after the state of the state of the onion, as I call it, because it stinks. <laughs> Um, and Biden did, uh, reference, uh, the Kennedys and Martin Luther King and all these other people who have been assassinated. And I'm saying that word because for some reason, RFK Jr., the man whose name historically is synonymous with some of the most historically significant assassinations in the history of our, com of our country gets denied, uh, secret service protection. What say you about that? I'm furious. I'm not going to lie. I'm furious. Yeah. When I heard Joe Biden say that last night, that he invoked the memory of the assassination of Robert Kennedy, which for older Americans is still a, a wound that's never healed. Same with JFK. But he had yeah. the nerve to invoke the name of Bobby's father when everybody knows that Bobby's been begging for Secret Service protection for almost a year now. He entered the race last April and immediately asked for Secret Service protection because when your last name is Kennedy and you're running for president, um, it, it seems to me that that should have just been an automatic yes. And that's, yeah. that's what President Jimmy Carter did for his uncle, Senator Ted Kennedy. You mm -hmm. might, I'm sure you remember, in oh, sure. 1979, of course, Kennedy and Carter were bitter enemies. They did not like each other, didn't get along. And then, you know, Teddy decided to challenge the incumbent president for the uh, Democratic nomination in 1980. But here's what's interesting about that. Jimmy Carter, no matter what you think of his presidency, he did the right and decent thing. He, with using the power of the presidential pen, he didn't have to run it past Congress of course, there was no Department of Homeland Security back then, but the president yeah. himself has the power to grant Secret Service protection with the stroke of a pen to anyone for any reason at any time. And so President Carter gave his arch enemy, Ted Kennedy, Secret Service protection two months before Ted Kennedy officially entered the race. He had started an exploratory committee word was out around washington that teddy was probably going to run and so president carter just did the right thing he said of course i'll give him secret service protection it was it was an automatic yeah. yes and it's obvious to me and to anybody who's paying attention that uh president biden is weaponizing the the secret service protection against bobby kennedy yeah. you know i think he's i don't want to yeah. go so far as to say he's wishing him harm because they've been friends for 40 years. That's why Mr. Kennedy is so baffled yeah. by this. Um, he knows Joe Biden quite well. The Bidens and the Kennedys have been friends for a long time. So uh, I think it hurts Bobby. I think it's painful for him on a personal level too, as well as sure. a financial level, because the cost of paying for private security, I think I was told it's about a million dollars a month. That sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. You uh -huh. got to keep in mind, these aren't security guards at your local, uh, um, you know, a warehouse. You know, these are skilled individuals with uh, advanced communication and uh, firearms training and uh, all, all these other kinds of things. And they don't work cheap. So, yeah, right. that's and, and, and it. And you're a you're a historian. You know that, for example, uh, JFK's assassination changed federal laws, for example, when that happened down in Dallas, the federal government, a lot of people don't understand why the federal government didn't do this and do that. They actually didn't have jurisdiction in that situation like they do now when, when, a, when a president That's is That's true. <laughs> Shocking yeah. though it yeah. may and, be in uh, 1963, the murder of a yeah. president was not a federal crime. Yes. And the other thing is uh, Bobby's assassination in 1968 is what uh, started candidates uh, getting Secret Service protection. That's right. So it, it's just odd that the family that was part of the evolution of protecting uh, presidents and candidates, this person does not get um, Secret Service protection. So interesting. And getting by back the way, to, uh, the, I, I just wanted ahead. to say, if I could, um, just this week, the campaign sent their sixth request to the Biden administration, once again, with a, another 
tall stack of threats that Bobby has received. And he's been getting threats since the day he entered the campaign. Um, And one threat was so specific that this unnamed individual says that they plan to assassinate him on the anniversary, June 5th, of his father's assassination, which is just chilling, absolutely chilling. If I were the president or I were Secretary Mayorkas, I would just give that a big green check mark and say, yes, of course you can have Secret Service protection. And by the way, Nikki Haley had Secret Service protection for, what, two weeks before she dropped out of the race? So all that money, they probably had several months worth of protection already budgeted for Nikki Haley. Why not just transfer that over to Bobby Kennedy? Yeah. I, I, I don't know, but I, I gotta tell you, that's, that's, that's awful. Um, I can't, if, 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 if I was, you know, getting back to Carter, I, I believe Carter was a very good person and I believe history is going to be very kind to his presidency. It wasn't at the time. Um, but as, as the, as the years go on, a lot of what he tried to do in the middle East, for example, a lot of other things, he, he I believe history is going to be kind to his presidency. And a lot of people may not appreciate that. Yeah. I agree he with you on be, that. Yeah. And here again, I'm not a partisan. I, I'm not saying that for any particular reason other than I, I, I believe that is true. Now, getting back to the old Kennedys, I'll say the old Kennedys, uh, <laughs> the Kennedys that uh, made history back in the 1960s. They were part of an ideal of progressiveness and and being a liberal that really doesn't exist today. They would not qualify any more than Ronald Reagan would qualify as a conservative today. So you have a new uh, uh, breed of, of liberal and getting back to RFK, he, a lot of his family members do not support him from what I understand. I mean, they, they, he, he is not the um, Kennedy that tradition has kind of turned out. What sets him apart? Well, I'll say this. The Kennedys have always been traditionally what you'd call good Democrats meaning that they always support whoever the Democratic Party's nominee is. They support uh, the president's agenda. And I will point out that I think five members of the Kennedy family currently work for the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. So I chalk this up, excuse me, more to politics than Mm. anything personal. Um, You know, the Kennedys are still a very close-knit, tight, loving family. I hope that when they get together for Thanksgiving dinner or the 4th of July, that, you know, that 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 tension isn't there. Uh, I know they love Bobby very much and he loves them. But I would chalk this up to just politics. And it's a game of loyalty in politics, as you well know. And uh, unfortunately, they've decided that their loyalty is to President Biden and the Democratic Party instead of their own brother or cousin, you know, um, it's very unfortunate. But I should also point out that there are other other members of the Kennedy family who do support him and his campaign. And those are the ones that the media doesn't talk about. They don't tell you about that. They talk about Bobby Shriver, who opposes him, but they don't talk about Anthony Shriver, his cousin, who's been out there fundraising and uh, doing all that he can to help Bobby. Uh, Bobby's children support him, as far as I know, all of them do. Um, his son, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. The third, is frequently a guest on Twitter spaces when we host RFK spaces on Twitter, or X, as it's now called. And his daughter-in-law is the campaign manager, Amaryllis Fox. Interesting. Uh, I'll ask you this to kind of wrap things up and springboard into the future here. What message of hope would you have for our political process at this point? Moving into the, the election, getting closer and closer by the minute. It's hard to find hope at times like this. It really is, even for an eternal optimist like me. I can honestly tell you that if Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was not in the race this year, I would feel very hopeless for America's future. I probably wouldn't vote. There's nobody else in this race that I could support in good conscience. 
And I've never been yeah. one of those political animals who just goes along with the party line, even if I don't like the nominee. So I would stay home. I, I wouldn't vote. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't feel that there's anything or anyone to believe in. Um, yeah. So it was truly an, uh, an answered prayer when Bobby got in the race. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'd been wanting this to happen since 2007. Yeah. Um, and so it was a dream come true for Bobby to get in the race, not just for me personally, but I truly believe that he's the last best hope for America and that we're running yeah. out of time. We, we, I, I don't think this country can take another four years of Bidenflation of these wars that keep escalating and escalating and leading us literally into world war three. Um, I, I honestly think that Donald Trump had his turn and I'm not saying that he was a bad president. I'm just saying that Bobby Kennedy would be a better yeah. president. Yeah. Let's hope, um, because it's, uh, it's going to, as once I, once we get into spring and summer and the election, you know, they, they start having the conventions and everything. It's going, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of very strange energy in the air. It's going to be a very interesting time. And, yeah. um, I'm hoping for the best no matter who wins, uh, because obviously I want a bright future for the country. And I think most people do. Where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at real Lori Spencer. That's also my username on YouTube. If you want to look me up there, uh, I'm on rumble. You can look for me there at Lori Spencer. And, uh, we do a show live show every Saturday night called strange bedfellows nine to 11 Eastern. And uh, I'm on Facebook and most of the other platforms, too. But I spend most of my time on X. I, I've always been a fan of Twitter. I love the free speech that we have on Twitter. And you'll usually find me hosting or hopping into a Twitter space, which is where I'm headed when we finish up this interview, actually. I'm uh, due for an RFK Twitter space. <laughs> awesome. I might have to go check that out. Yeah, I noticed uh, that you attend those a lot, and I'm so glad to see you there. And uh, if you'd like to hop in, I'll hand you a mic and bring you up on stage. We'd love to have you, Billy. All right. Well, thank you. That's very generous of you. Uh, my name is Billy Dees. You can find me on uh, the old Twitter, which is now called X, at Billy Dees. That's kind of like my social media home as well. Um, all my, uh, links are in my bio and you can find the Billy D's podcast. If you're just searching the podcast, you can find it anywhere. We're on all the major networks, all the major podcast networks. So real easy to find the Billy D's podcast. Thank you, Lori, so much for coming on the program today. Pleasure was mine. Great to meet you. Uh, Let's do it again. And please absolutely. come on my show sometime. Uh, you, you. all you have to do is give me the word and I'll be you're there. invited. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And thank you for listening to our podcast today. Thank you very much. And we will talk to you again next week.